probably do whatever the fuck they want. But the, but then you have to marry your the passion that you have for the thing that you want to do with like all these other things like good advice, money, space. And so I'm I'm trying to figure out how to be a friend with institutions and just be an institution. I think that's spot on. I'm so glad you also talked about the Bauhaus because one of the things that I did write down when you were speaking was this question of design. Mm -hmm. And Franklin, you brought it up as well. I mean, if you want to talk about a definition of art being somewhat historically useless, I mean, literally beautiful to look at, obviously, you know, intelligent, but not very useful socially. Um, you talk about a sense of kind of modularity in the way you work out your space. You talk about functionality as well, and I think that also comes through a craft. And so I'm wondering also if you think about your work maybe even sometimes being more aligned with a design uh, sensibility than a fine art sensibility. Well, uh, uh, in the moment when uh, the world wars were done and they were trying to figure out what to do with these steel mills, and uh, the Italians figured out that they could like create the Italians, the, the Swiss, like Europe was trying to figure, the, the Americans were trying to figure out with the Eames, what can we do with these mills that like like would allow us uh, for the the American soldier to come back home and in a in a in an affordable way benefit from uh, the byproducts of a war industry? You know the, the, the same. You know I feel like that moment where people were grappling with like new design that was based on old industries that was a really beautiful moment. And the people that were trying to grapple with that were not just there was maybe even not a name for a designer yet. You were maybe an architect, or you were, uh, you could draw, you know, you were a painter, and then you, you, you involved yourself with the problem of, of society. And, this is, and one problem could have been that um, these soldiers coming home from war are gonna need their first house in a, in a good place to live and some nice cheap furniture. And, and, and so we gotta deliver from Europe uh, a, a way so that that could happen for America. That I, that I think in a way, I don't, I don't think I'm a, a designer, I'm, I'm not a designer, but I think I can use this, the skills or the tools that I have in relationship to some other thing. And so sometimes my problem is the museum and I got 2,000 square feet, and sometimes my problem is the block and I got eight houses. But I feel like it's the same brain thinking about um, you know, the 150 square feet that we have across the way um, and having to solve that problem in a way that, that makes meaning for me and makes meaning for other people. But then there's another problem that happens outside of uh, the armory that I also want to lend my brain to. And I, I feel like it's okay to, you know, it's all right to think about them both, you know. And, and I don't feel marginal or outside. So, so because I think that a marginal artist is somebody who has struggled for a certain kind of recognition and doesn't get it. Or has struggled to want a certain kind of financial or uh, the respect of their peers. So there are all these things about like who's defining the margin. And like I always felt like I was very popular among my friends in the black music scene. And that was like enough love. I could get like a girlfriend. I could like you know, get into parties for free. All the things that were important to me. <laughs> like they kind of worked out. I was only marginal to these other people who didn't who didn't know me, and they felt that they were in the center. <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about fiction. Thank you. <laughs> like you're gonna go somewhere else anyway. Um, talk a little bit about fiction. I remember um, in past conversations with you. Um, Thinking about a fictional character, and tell me if you don't want to go here. Okay, right? A fictional character who is a black ceramicist who moved to Japan at some point. Yeah. And began to make objects for tea ceremonies. Yeah. I also remember that you came up with a, um, forgive me because I'm not going to say the name of the um, but you came up with a kind of uh, workers' organization for like. The black Association America. of Named Negro American Potters, ANAP. ANAP, exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> could you walk us through a little bit, like how these kind of fictional characters and these fictional institutions really function for your work, and what like problems they solve? Yeah, you get a phone call. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So, 
Uh, fiction is survival. Um, in a moment when uh, being a potter wasn't popular, uh, I gave myself a story that made me feel like my being a potter was okay. In a way that uh, spending time in Japan and learning about Japanese ceramics and then having this really rarefied skill set could make me look like an appropriator of Japanese things, I wanted to kind of complicate my relationship with Japan without having to talk about my relationship with Japan. Japan. It was a kind of, it was a device that kind of helped me cope with my marginality, right? Um, it was also a way of framing a very complex set of relationships that I had with the world um, through, these, through these objects that on the surface were just pots. That like gave, that made people look at the pots differently and only differently because it was seen through the eyes of a Japanese potter. So like, all of a sudden, the pots were made more beautiful because like, Shoji Yamaguchi made it. That was really interesting. But what it did was it gave me life, I gave myself permission through this fiction to make a body of work that was like flat-footedly cups and bowls and teapots. Three years later, Dave the Slave Potter gives me another opportunity to like connect with the real, connect with the black, really be a potter in my skin, working with a team of all white union ceramic productionists in Kohler, Wisconsin. Brilliant. Museum of Contemporary Art in May of this year is allowing me to build a ceramic manufacturing corporation that will create uh, 40,000 ceremonial soul food wares. I'll go to Japan and get two Japanese potters. They'll train 10 black peace workers. That over the course of these five to seven years, that fiction has caught up with itself. And that sometimes you gotta like lie through things. You gotta like, you gotta like give yourself enough of a narrative that you don't divorce the thing that's dear to you. And so it was like, I just used the narrative until I didn't need a fiction anymore. And all through it, I needed the narrative to be legible. And now, the ceremonial soul food pavilion that'll happen on my block, and the, the you know, there will be a real association of named Negro American powders, and I won't be the only motherfucker in it. <laughs> and, really, you know, and, and so, I think that there is a way that the fiction, the fiction was always loaded with truth. It's just potential the, truth. Potential, but but the fiction is needed less and less because there's there's. I don't need the fiction anymore. That's brilliant. Before we open it up to the crowd, I'm wondering, frankly, if you want to interject anything or have a question in particular. Well, one of the things when you said this idea of fiction and the and the artists, I think one of the things that I guess we have a, a panel coming up in a month or so on Thornton Dial, and um, I mean it's an interesting subject. I think in light of some of the things that you've talked about, in the ways in which an artist is perceived, um, and, and you know you touched on you know uh, on that a little bit, but I guess this article in the Times a couple of weeks ago reminds me of the ways in which we perceive art. And it was reinforced again by an article in the Times again last week in the ways in which we perceive art and artists, particularly black artists, for the sake of this conversation. Uh, the second article deals with the artist Glenn Ligon. Now, how does the word outsider come up in a conversation on Glenn Ligon? <laughs> it's mind-boggling and it's super annoying. And so I think you might have something to say about that. That it, it really depends on who's writing. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Anita and Carrie James Marshall were making this point that, like, uh, black people don't spend enough time writing their own shit. And as long as, as long as somebody else from somewhere else is trying to really sincerely understand what you're about, they may have the wrong signifier. They may not even know a vocabulary of signifiers that we all have in common. And so we just got to figure out why ain't no black newspapers or to counter the times? Or why ain't no black writers writing those features about Glenn Ligon? So, or why isn't there a team of people that are cross-vetting those uh, keywords so that we're a little bit clear? Like, there are 12, 15, 20 people in this room that could have given a different adjective for Glenn's work had the writer um, understood the importance of vetting those kind of keywords. 